Well, good morning, and welcome to Lincoln Heights Baptist Church, our worship service this morning, hosted uh, at the home of, uh, of my house, uh, the Wilson home. Uh, it's so good to see you all, and, uh, and it's Mother's Day, so, uh, so happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there, it is, uh, and all you ladies out there, it is a joy to be worshiping with you today. We want to honor you, tell you how special uh, you are, and we are so we are so thankful for you. I always enjoy Mother's Day uh, when we're together at church. The attendance always rivals like any any day of the year, even more than Christmas and Easter, because moms use their their weight, their uh, their their power on that day to drag the whole family to church. I love it. Uh, we're not able to be together today, but we are going to worship together. Uh, via Facebook Live. Uh, so happy Mother's Day. Also, this uh, happens to be uh, our youngest daughter, Carly's 14th birthday today. So happy birthday, Carly. And, uh, and uh, our family is going to actually, in a few minutes, we're going we're gonna to sing together a, a song that, uh, I mean, we're going to lead you in, in worship uh, on a second song. But let's, um, let's uh, pray together, and, uh, and then I'm going to invite uh, my wife, Denise, uh, and I say, give a shout out to her. Happy Mother's Day, Denise. And thank you for being the mother of our children. And uh, we will uh, we'll lead you uh, in worship. But uh, let's uh, pray together first. Good morning, Father. We love you. We're so thankful for your kindness that you have saved us, not because we are worthy, not because we are good. You've saved us through the blood of your Son. You sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life and then die on the cross our sins and it's by faith in him and in him alone that our sins are forgiven and we can know you and experience your grace and your peace and your love god i ask that you would bless our family and that you would bless every family connected to our ministry and every family of those that will be watching this service at, at any time that you would press favor and pour goodness into their life and remind us of uh, of, of how wonderful and how how much you love us we ask that you be glorified and you would be honored today. Once again, thank you for Christ. And thank you for our mothers. And, uh, and, and Father, And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And with that, I'll invite Denise to come sit here with me. And uh, we're going to begin by singing um, Hear here Our Praises. Hey, uh -huh.
started singing. Well, I'm going to tune really fast, and with that, I'm going to invite the rest of our family to come and join us in singing this next song. It's uh, called Get Not I, but through Christ and me. And I believe my mother is probably watching this service, so I'll give a shout out to my mom today. Happy Mother's Day, Janice Wilson. Okay. song we started doing in our church in the last year. Uh, we really like this song. The lyrics are amazing. We invite you to, to sing this uh, sing this song with us.
Well, thank you for singing those songs with us. And kids, thank you. And Denise, thank you for worshiping with us. And, and Lacey also, when we get in the action there. Would somebody take this guitar away? Awesome. Well, thank you. By way of announcements, I just, uh, once again, want to remind you how important it is that you connect with, uh, with our church, Stay Connected. And I know that we're not uh, worshiping together in the building, and we're not having a small group Bible uh, Sunday school classes right now. But there are some ways that I've been sharing that you can, can stay connected uh, to our ministry. The first one is by tuning into all of our services. We have a morning uh, worship service at 11 that our family hosts right here. And then again on Wednesday, it's a little less formal, more of a Bible study. We've been working on helps for relationships. And, and so that's uh, Wednesdays at 7 p.m. You can watch it later, and that's fine. If, if possible, watch it live. But if, but if not, just watch it. Make sure you're staying connected. And then the second thing is pray for one another. Pray for families in our church. Pray for people that the Lord lays upon your heart. Get your buzz book out. Pray for families. And then third, reach out to families. Uh, text them. Call them. Email them. Uh, have some way of checking on them and letting them know that you're thinking about them and that you're praying for them. And the fourth way is to continue to support the ministry um, of our church uh, through financial giving. If you're a member or tender of our church, and there's many ways you can do that. You can give online by going to our website, LincolnHeightsBaptistChurch.com, at the bottom. You can scroll to the bottom, and it'll take you to a, a secure site where you can uh, then donate. Uh, you can also uh, run in any of your tithes and offerings on, on Monday mornings from 8 to 12, where uh, the building is open, someone's there. And then you can always uh, mail it in along the way. But we are so uh, thankful that you're staying connected. And I have, when I, when I reach out to you all, uh, you have been sharing with me that other people have been reaching out to you. And so that really is a, a joy, joy to my heart. So it is Mother's Day, and this is my, I'm in my 19th year. I'm going to finish 19 years at Lincoln Heights very, very shortly. And so my habit over the years on Mother's Day and Father's Day is I want to, I want to say something, especially I told you moms have this way of dragging husbands, Kids, grandkids, cousins, nieces, nephews to church with them on Mother's Day. And so I never want to uh, dishonor the work that a mother had done by, you know, just talking about how wonderful a mother is or something like that. So I would tend to do um, a character study on Mother's Day of a woman and in honor of Mother's Day. And then on Father's Day, a character study of a man from the Bible, Bible character, uh, in honor of Father's Day. And that way, there's still something, some, some good, applicable truth <coughs> for every for everyone. But in honor of Mother's Day, I do have a little anecdote I do want to share this morning. My mother actually did say some of these, but not all of these. So it's not something my mother always said, although she did say a lot of these. But uh, it's lessons from my mother. Um, Here's, here's some lessons from my mother. My mother taught me religion. She said, you better pray that it'll come out of the carpet. My mother taught me about logic. She said, if you fall out of that swing and break your neck, you're not going to the store with me. <laughs> my mother taught me about the science of osmosis. She said, shut your mouth and eat your supper. My mother taught me about contortionism. She says, well, she said, will you look at the dirt on the back of your neck? My mother taught me about hypocrisy. She said, if I've told you once, I've told you a million times. Don't exaggerate. My mother taught me about envy. She said, there are millions of less fortunate children in this world who don't have wonderful parents like you do. My mother taught me about receiving. She'd say, and my mom did say this, you're going to get it when we get home. My mother taught me about medical science. She said, if you don't stop rolling your eyes, they're going to freeze that way. My mother taught me about humor. She said, when that lawnmower cuts off your toes, oh, come running to me. <laughs> and my mother taught me about justice. She said, one day you'll have kids, and I hope they turn out just like you. So that's an anecdote for mothers out there everywhere. 
One more. I heard a four-year-old and a six-year-old presented their mom with a house plant. They had used their own money, and she was thrilled. And the older one of them had a sad face, and she said, There was a bouquet there that we really wanted to give you at the flower shop. It was real pretty, but it was too expensive, and it had a ribbon on it that said, Rest in Peace. And we thought it would be just perfect since you're always asking for a little peace so you can rest. One person described a mother as overworked, overstretched, and under, underslept. So uh, for all you mothers out there, uh, a shout out to you. Thank you so much for raising us and raising us well. We love you. Uh, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1. We are going to do a profile study, four or five points, a profile study of, uh, of a lady in the Bible named Hannah. And we'll read that in just a moment. First Samuel chapter 1, give you a moment to turn there. <clears throat> so this morning we are going to examine a lady from the Old Testament, do a character study on her. And the lady we're doing, as I mentioned, is, is Hannah. Now last summer we, uh, we looked at Hannah in a sermon. Uh, just probably sometime in August, but what? But we examined and outlined uh, her prayer, not her life. We primarily went straight to chapter 2 and looked at what it looked like for a person to praise and thank the Lord. Because, uh, of course, chapter 2 is after she has her prayer answered. She then, uh, well, we'll get into that story, but it, it ends with a, a really long prayer. And so in the summer, in August, we actually looked at Hannah from the perspective of her, of her prayer of thanksgiving. So today, we're going to primarily stay in chapter 1 and examine her, her life and, and her character. And this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to see five aspects of Hannah's life that I think are relevant and applicable to anyone, regardless if you're a mother or not a mother, if you're a man or a woman or, or, or just whatever. I think five lessons that we'll learn today that are helpful. Now, to give you a little background in what's going on in 1 Samuel chapter 1 with Hannah, Hannah, Hannah was, was childless in a society, back in a society, back in the day in a society where the main duty of a woman was to produce children. So think about this. In an age when children were very much seen as gifts from God, her barrenness would have been seen as a terrible misfortune or, or really a curse. Her husband, Elkanah, did his best to console her, but still, in accordance with the custom of his times, uh, he had taken a second wife, uh, who then did uh, bear him children that, that Hannah had, had been unable to provide. And the other wife... As we're going to see, her name is Penina. She never let Hannah forget about her inadequacies. And, and Hannah was a woman of faith who, who, who grieved over her infertility. And she expressed faith by praying to God and asking for provision. And then she did. She experienced, as we're going to see, she experienced God's provision and then responded by praising him and then keeping her promise. And you'll find out about that which is going to result in, in giving her son to the Lord to live and to work in the temple all the days of his life. And God then used her son, Samuel, to replace an, an apathetic high priest by the name of Eli in order to bring reform to that particular office and also reform and revival to a religious system of that day that had gone, had gone south. But one of the commentaries that I read uh, said this. They said the true reason this story exists in this book, in the book of 1 Samuel, is to dis dis demonstrate, there it is, demonstrate God's absolute power over all human institutions by changing the course of Israel's history through one of Israel's weakest and least significant individuals, a rural, barren woman named Hannah. Uh, it's and so that's the purpose. Um, but today I also want to focus on the attitudes and actions of Hannah, which truly expressed to us that she was a person, a person of faith. So we're going to jump into the passage. I've got four or five points. The first point that I want you to see, and here's, if you're taking notes, there's not a whole lot to take down, four or five points today. But uh, uh, she was a lady with a real problem. She was a lady with a real problem. If you're taking notes, that's the first point. She was a lady with a real problem. 
And, and if you've heard me preach uh, on character studies before, you, you know that this is an, an ax that I grind often. Um, I, I have a problem sometimes with, uh, with the way, so I have a problem with the way Christians sometimes approach the, the narratives, the stories in the Bible. And, and the problem that I have is that it's easy to think that the heroes in the Bible or the people who expressed great obedience or incredible amounts of faith or trust in the Lord, it's easy to think that these heroes in the Bible somehow were different than we are. Like we kind of make a mental note, put an asterisk by them. She showed great faith, but she's a Bible character. He showed great obedience, but he's a Bible character. They showed great courage. Well, I know, but they're a Bible character. We put an asterisk by their, by their example as if it really doesn't have a lot of weight in how we can live and how we should live and how we should have faith and how we should conquer sin and how we should trust in the Lord or, or whatever it is. We put an asterisk by it and go, yeah, but they were a Bible, a Bible character. Somehow we think that it's, uh, that it's tough to relate to them because their lives were so perfect or their culture was so different. But here's the thing you have to realize about all of them, and today especially Hannah, they were real people with real problems who faced them with real faith. In some cases, not real faith. You know, today it's going to be an encouraging example of a woman who did. And so the thing I want you to see and so that you can relate to her, is she was a problem. She was a lady. <laughs> she wasn't a problem. She was a problem to Penina, right? She didn't like her. She was a lady with a real, you can't see it, but my family's laughing at me right now. Terrible. She was a lady with, um, with, a, real, with a real problem. Uh, and I think it's important to know, because do you have any problems in your life? Do you ever use them as an excuse as to why you can't stand up and live by faith and walk in obedience? Why you, you have a situation that no one understands and if they did, they would realize why it's so hard for you to walk in obedience or whatever. Um, that, so I think it's important that we realize that. That Bible characters were real people with real problems. She's a lady with a real problem. Um, have you ever met someone where you thought, you know, I can't learn from them because their life is is so perfect you know like I got this friend and uh, they're they're everything and I, their example is more discouraging than encouraging because they're perfect they have a perfect house they have a perfect car they have great cars they have a perfect spouse they have immaculate hair immaculate clothes their kids are perfect I can't be like that I can't relate to them I can't learn from them you ever feel that way are you ready for this you ready for this it's not real they're not perfect they're not there are things in their lives that is a mess. Guarantee it. They're not perfect. And so you can learn from others. I just think sometimes we use that as an excuse. Well, I got problems. Well, okay. I got problems too. We all got problems. Hannah had problems. She was a lady with a real problem. So let's read about her problem. First uh, Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Let me read this for us. And there's some weird names, so if I don't get them right, I'm just going to Say them loudly and with authority so you think I know how to pronounce them. <clears throat> there was a certain man of Ramathame, Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jer uh, uh, Jeroham, the son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zoph, and Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, as often as he went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat, and Elkanah her husband said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? 
And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? We're going to start right there, and we're going to pray over uh, this sermon and over uh, the Word of God today. Um, would you repeat after me before we pray? God is good, and He does all things well. His Word is true, and through it, He will change my life. Let's pray together. Good morning, once again, we come before you and we ask for your grace and your goodness. We ask that you, through your Holy Spirit, Father, that you would breathe upon the passage, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2, and that you would speak deeply into our hearts. You would encourage, you would inspire, you would convict if need be. You'd help us to be people of faith, people of prayer, people of obedience. We would keep our commitments and we would praise and thank you and worship you for your provision. We just once again just ask that you would minister and move in the hearts of people, homes that right now, uh, on, a, on a wonderful day where it's Mother's Day, and people are, are having a hard time really celebrating because um, they're, they're people with real problems. I ask that you would remind them that you are greater and you are bigger than any problem they're facing, and that you love them, and that uh, if they're unbelievers, you want to save them, and if they're believers, then you want to fill them and bless them and help them. And we pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so let's just kind of walk through the story that we have here in the first eight verses and try to understand some things. So the first thing we learn is that there is a man by the name of Elkanah. And we're going to learn some things about him. We learn where he lives. Um, but the, the, the first important thing we really learn about him is that he has two wives. Two wives. Um, Penina had, uh, had children, and uh, Hannah, just a second, I got a cat that wants to get involved here in the worship today. Go away. Go to Denise. I am so sorry about this. Okay, I got a cat trying to steal, a, steal the blind line here. Um, so we have, uh, we have a man with two wives. Um, Penina has children. We're learning some very important facts here. Penina has children, but here's the here's the kicker. Here's here's the kicker of the whole passage. This is where where it all hinges and changes. Hannah has none. Uh, back then, especially back then, the wife's role was to provide children. A barren womb can, was considered actually a, a, back then it was a curse. Um, she would have been she would have looked down on. Uh, Contrary to today, where people kind of make a decision not to have children or something, um, in that day, she would have been looked down on. She would have been she would have been seen as spiritually disturbed, or socially disgraced, or emotionally um, depressed. Um, in verse three, we see that uh, that Elkanah yearly would make the the twenty mile journey to Shiloh. Back then, it was uh, Shiloh was the it was the early center of Israelite worship. This is way before, you know, Jerusalem is going to be set up as the place. It was Shiloh at this point. And Shiloh was the place where the hub of, of uh, is, Israelite worship took place. And, and Elkanah, something else we know about him, was he was spiritually devout. He was a, an honorable man, man who was religious, who loved the Lord, and was uh, devout spiritually. When the whole culture was headed south spiritually, and this is the time of the judges. If, if you didn't know how to place Samuel, uh, the beginning of Samuel, into, uh, into the story of the Bible, it is the early period of the judges. And so you know that's a, a time where things are not great, spiritually speaking. So when the whole culture was headed south spiritually, Elkanah, he swam against the tide of apathy and took his family to church. It's a little shout out to husbands right there. I know it's not Father's Day, it's Mother's Day. But how important it is that husbands lead their families in righteousness and lead their families to church. And oftentimes, you know, men, are, men are the last ones out of bed on a Sunday and a wife's uh, trying to drag them out of bed. Not Elkanah and, and hopefully not you. That's Hopefully that's not true of our church, that men are leading their families in worship and going to church and living living. For God, and so they would go up once a year to Shiloh, and while they were there, uh, we learn in verse four and five that they gave a sacrificial. They would sacrifice an animal, 
And uh, he would then take a portion of that, Elkanah, the priest would get a portion of that, and he would get a portion of that, and he would bring that back to his family, that, that sacrificial meat to his family. It was a thank offering. That's the part they would say was the thank offering. And the worshipers were allowed to eat the part that was not offered to God. It would be a thank offering. And, and then because Hannah um, was barren and was so sad about it, he would each year would give her a double portion to Hannah. In a sense, he would biggie size her meal uh, to let her know how much he cared about her and was sorry for her situation. And it had to be difficult for Hannah to eat food associated with a thank offering when probably she wasn't very thankful in that moment. So they were a, a devout family, but they were also a divided family. And this was not God's original intent. Elkanah had likely had married Hannah first. She's mentioned first. So I'm assuming he married her first, but then chose to marry Penina when Hannah came up barren. Now, the Bible records polygamous relationships, but it does not condone them. You need to understand that. He's not condoned for doing that. He's not being told, hey, way to go, guy. Um, it, it, doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't matter. In fact, other places, it's going to say, don't do that. But in this passage, it doesn't condone it, uh, but, it, it, but it, it simply records it. Someone once said that the penalty of bigamy is two mother-in-laws. And here's the thing. The wives didn't get along. Penina realized that she probably wasn't Elkanah's first love, original wife. It was kind of a plan B. <clears throat> and she would provoke Hannah. She would, um, that word literally means to cause thunder, try to cause Hannah to blow her top. She, she would irritate her. She would stir her up inwardly by teasing her and poking at her and talking about how, how she's inadequate and how she has no kids and no one to care for her and just was using Hannah's awful situation, discouraging circumstance, uh, as a source of, uh, of a weapon to harm, to harm her. And two different times in this passage, it becomes clear um, that it was that Hannah's, Hannah's misfortune was actually a part of God's plan. You, you can't miss this. Two different times, even in the midst of the, when it expresses um, Penina's um, antagon, antagonism against Hannah, it mentions twice that the Lord was the one who closed Hannah's womb. Job 2.10 says this, Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? Ecclesiastes 7, verse 13 and 14 says this, Consider the work of God, for who is able to straighten what he has meant? In the day of prosperity, be happy. But in the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other, so that men may not discover anything that will be after him. We know that, that God has ordained that our life would be filled with both blessings and blows. Both encouraging things and discouraging things, and that the cumulative effect of, of, of God bringing and allowing both wonderful and difficult things is that it's going to create something appropriate and mature um, in, our, in our lives. And so people of faith don't just live fairy tale lives. That's what I want you to catch. You just think about so many people in the Bible um, Esther, Ruth, Sarah, Rahab, even Mary, the mother of Jesus, they all experience difficulties. Real uh, Women of real faith have issues. Um, you, you meet a woman of real faith and you might find that there's some things in her life that are a discouragement to her. Some of them have been divorced. Some of them have wayward children. Some of them have, have incredible health issues. Some of them have financial difficulties. Some of them are in tough job situations. Some of them really struggle with, with loneliness. I think it's very important that you understand uh, that Hannah, just like many other godly people, are people with, with a real problem. Like I said earlier, the, uh, the other wife, Penina, never let Hannah forget her inadequacy. And it all came to a head on this annual family trip to Shiloh. She had, had all she could handle, you know, kind of like uh, Popeye. Um, I'm picking all I can stands, and we can't stands no more. Well, that's where Hannah is. But instead of turning into a missile and, you know, clobbering Penina in the face, <laughs> like Popeye would have done to Brutus, she, 
went to the temple to worship, tabernacle to worship. And um, it all came to a head on this annual family trip to Shiloh. It was supposed to be a feast, a holiday, a celebration for Hannah, um, but instead it was torture. The taunts of arrival became too much for her to bear. In desperation, Hannah got up from the meal and went to pray. And she prayed, if you, if you give me a son, she said to the Lord, I promise he will serve you all of his life. And she was in such a state that at first Eli, the high priest, is going to think that she's drunk. But she uh, explained herself, and, and Eli was able to assure her that her prayer would be answered. One last thing before we move on. In one sense, this story um, is about how a barren woman got a son. But in another sense, this story is about how a spiritual barren nation got a leader in, in Samuel. So let's look at the next point in verses 9 through 18. We're going to see that she was a lady who believed in praying to God. So she was a lady with a real problem. She was also a lady who believed in praying to God. Look in verse 9 through 18. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. And she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son that I will give him, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. And she continued praying before the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. And Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. For all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. And then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer, was no longer sad. So one of the things that seems like it always comes up when I do a sermon on the Psalms, like I had the last couple of weeks, uh, godly people know where to go when their life stinks. They know where to go. So many places you can go. You can run to a bottle. You can run to a pill. You can run to pornography. You can run to a bucket of chicken. You can run to movies and television and shows. You can, spend, you can run to a mall or a store. All kinds of things you can do to try to medicate yourself. You can try to make yourself look pretty. You can go to the gym. You can just, you can get lost in a million things to try to, to try to cover up or medicate the wounds of your soul. But godly people know where to go when life stings. Uh, David teaches us this. Hannah teaches us this. Where did she go when, when this family, this annual family vacation turned absolutely south? Where did she go? She went to the Lord. Hannah had problems, but she didn't shut down or lash out to those around her. She didn't medicate herself or find other ways to, um, to comfort her heart. She went to the place of worship and spoke to God. Some of you, as soon as this service is over, the thing you have to need to do is get on your knees and take your issues to the Lord. You've bought books from Amazon. You have... Talk to people about it. You're working on self-help methods. You've, you've run to a million different things. But the one thing you haven't done is you have not taken your struggles, your problems, your, your burdens, your anxiety, your pressures to the Lord. Let Hannah be an example to you. She expressed her faith in prayer. Psalm 119 verse 71 says this, It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. And so in her affliction, she's running to the place of healing. She's running to the place of faith and righteousness. Al Allen Redpath said this, when God has an impossible task, he takes an impossible person 
and crushes them. God is going to use Hannah's difficulty uh, to make her a godly woman and to do great things to her son. She refers to the Lord as Almighty. She calls him the Lord Almighty. And this refers to all the armies of heaven. This, it's a military term. She's appealing to the power and the authority of God. And so when she calls him this in a passage, she is acknowledging, um, she's acknowledging his authority um, over, over her life, over her womb, over her family. And, uh, and she, she makes a vow to the Lord. I think we've got to be careful making vows to the Lord. I think we can make vows to the Lord, but we need to be very careful in doing so. But she makes a vow to the Lord. If you give me a son, then I will give him to the Levitical priest. And, I will, and I'll, I'll keep the Nazarite vow for him, for his life. And you can use him. He'll be yours. And so she, she's a lady who believed in praying to God. The third thing we learn about her in verses 19 and 20 is that she was a lady who experienced God's provision. So in verse 19 and 20, it says this, They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord, and then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew his wife, knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. She was a lady who experienced God's provision. So Hannah's prayer for a son was answered. The Lord opened her womb. And, and of course, I don't know if you know this, but uh, she has several, four or five other children after Samuel that she's going to be able to keep and raise for their, for their whole life, for her whole life. Um, Hannah's prayer for a son was answered. But the thing that I want you to understand is that does not automatically necessarily mean that you'll get everything you ask for or that you will be delivered exactly as you prayed, what you prayed for. She experienced provision. And I'll say this, you'll experience provision as well. But the issue is God's provision is not always our provision. You will receive God's provision, but not always the way we think it is. God is wise, God is loving, God is powerful, and he will do, he will provide for you exactly what he knows that you need, that will bring good to your life and glory to his name. And you just got to trust him in that. You ask him for a million bucks, chances are you're not going to get a million bucks, but, he, but he's going to provide for you in certain ways. Uh, they're not always the ways you want because our minds are not always turned toward the Lord. We're not always seeking the things that are above. Remember that Paul passage in Colossians? Seek the things that are above where Christ is. We're not always seeking the things above. And so our prayers are not always consistent with his heart. But what we know is when we come to him with a need, we know that he will provide. He will always provide for you. But it will be in his time, in his way, and it will be what he knows you need, not always what you want. So she was a lady who experienced God's provision, and, and, and you will too. You'll be a person, if you go to him in prayer, who will experience God's provision. We just don't always get a name, our gift. You know, there are some, some name it, claim it, blab it, grab it preachers out there that tell you to just, you know, name your name your miracle and, and have enough faith and God has to give it to you. That's just baloney. That's garbage. That's, that's awful theology. God will always take care of you and provide for you, but it will be in his time and in his way. And sometimes it'll look exactly like you asked for, but more often than not, it won't. But he will provide for you. God will always does right by us. Um, he always does. In some case, uh, he, he, that void you feel that you think you need, you know, a new job, a new house, new kid, new car, new whatever, Sometimes he fills it with himself, that void with himself, but he always provides. Four, she was a lady who took obedience to God seriously. She was a woman who took obedience to God seriously. Let me say this way. She, taught, she teaches us how to keep our commitments. She, she totally does. In verses 21 through 28, it says this. Then the man Elkanah and all of his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, 
do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So whatever you do, make sure you keep your words, what he's saying to his wife. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And then when she had weaned him, she took him with her along with a three-year-old bull, an epa of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And he, and he worshipped the Lord. Samuel worshipped the Lord there. She was a lady who took obedience to the Lord seriously. She took her commitment to the Lord seriously. She dedicated herself to nursing and nurturing the child, knowing that she would give him away when the time is right. Now, I don't have to tell you about this. You know how many times people have made deals with God. You know, you get me out of this situation, and I'll, I'll go to church every Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. And then as soon as he... He answers your request. Oh, Lord, you didn't take me serious on that. Not Wednesday nights, you know. Or I'll give, you know, I'll give 10% of all of my income. I'll do this or that. We make all these deals with the Lord when we're in, in bonds. And it's amazing how easy we go, oh, Lord, you're not going to make me. It's the same way. You know, you're in a bind and you need some help and you promise people. Just kind of people will pathetically promise you things they can't deliver. And then, of course, when you do something for them, then they're like, well, you know, you didn't take me seriously, did you? Well, I think a lot of times people do that to the Lord. Well, Hannah's lady takes obedience to the Lord seriously. She kept her commitment. It would have been easy for her to say, oh, Lord, you wouldn't really want me to give him to you, would you? Um, but she does exactly what, um, what she said she would do. Hannah not only dedicated herself to her child, but she dedicated her child to the Lord. Um, here's the thing you got to realize. Everything you own belongs to the Lord. Let me say this as a question. Is everything you own in the hands of Jesus to do as he pleases, even if it means you're not in control when things aren't done as you wish or think they should be? I love how she, how she this is costly sacrifice. To obey the Lord. And the last thing, she was a lady who praised God and was thankful. This is chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. I, I, I might just begin reading a little bit. This was actually, like I said, the sermon for last August or what. Uh, I will begin to read just the first two verses. But she, she comes to, she dedicates her son, and then she prays with all of her heart. Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. And then she continues praying that way. She was a lady who praised God and was thankful. She overlooked the gift and gives praise to the giver. I think sometimes we love the gift more than the giver. It's kind of like the kid who has an aunt that gives them a, an Xbox and they grab the Xbox. They forget to say thank you to the aunt or uncle or they do and they run into their room and then hook it up and then call all their friends and brag about how they got a better game set up than they do with no thought to the aunt. Uh, I think sometimes we do that. We, we love the gift more than the giver, but she loved the giver more than the gift. Uh, he was worthy of praise. And she praised him. Let me just give you a couple real, a couple closing thoughts really fast. And I guess I turn my mind more toward mothers on this one, but not completely, as I just end with a couple bullet statements. First of all, you are of great worth in God's eyes, whether or not you have a child. You are of great worth in God's eyes, whether or not you have experienced a huge difficulty in your life. I think sometimes not only do the difficulties cause us pain, but sometimes they cause us shame, needless shame. We feel shamed that some awful thing has happened to us. And I just want to say that you are of great worth in God's eyes. Whether or not you have a child or can have a child, 
whether or not you've experienced a huge difficulty in life or regardless if you have or, or don't have what others have or what they've experienced. The second thing, make it your mission, mothers and fathers, to give your children to the Lord for a lifetime of dedicated service. There's no greater purpose, no higher honor than to have your children give their lives and surrender to the service of the Lord. And I don't mean like full-time missionary or but just that they're going to live their lives to glorify and magnify the greatness of God. Um, the third thing um, is it's the importance of growing in our relationship with God. If you want your children to be godly, you, you got to model it, Mom. you got to model it, Dad. You want your children to know what it's like to hunger and thirst for, for Christ, you have to model it. If you want your children to turn to, to God in prayer, uh, at the first sign of issues in their life instead of the last thing. You've got to model that for them. And the last thing I'll say is this. It is impossible to be a great parent without real faith. It is because our greatest heritage uh, to give them is, uh, is, is our faith. And so be vibrant in your faith and give it away liberally to your children. Um, I'm going to end in closing prayer. So let's pray. Father, may you bless this study. May you move mightily in the lives of our people. May you encourage and may you inspire. We ask that you'd be pleased with this. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, happy Mother's Day. Thank you for worshiping with us this hour. Uh, if uh, the invitation, here's the invitation. If God has spoken in your heart and you want to hammer some things out with someone, we would love to. Reach out to me. Uh, myself, our assistant pastor, Chad Berry. We have a lot of other leaders, deacons, and, uh, and godly women who would love to be a source of encouragement to you. So reach out to me, we'll, and we'll, uh, we'll partner you with someone where you can uh, chit-chat with them for a while. Once again, happy Mother's Day. Have a wonderful day. See you later.